about some new stuff. New, exciting stuff. Okay, so what, we do, what we've talked about so far, we went through some problems on Monday, and before that we talked about sex linkage. We talked about the white gene and how it's on the X chromosome and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to generalize that a little bit. Because we're going to talk about how you identify genes on a chromosome. Because this is um, Thomas Hunt Morgan's big thing. Is okay, here's, here's Thomas Hunt Morgan again. He ran something called the Fly Room at, at Columbia University, a very famous little institution that churned out lots of award winning scientific students. And this is just a few of them that I'll mention here. So there's, there's T.H. Morgan working away. Notice those bottles. Do those look familiar? Nothing ever changes. Yeah, these are, these are one pint glass bottles. They were much easier to get back then when you uh, had dairy service. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not talking to you. Uh, wait. Anyway, so anyway, yeah, so nowadays it's kind of tricky and expensive to get these things, but we've got, we've got the classic pint milk bottles in there. Uh, some of his other students, though, are, for instance, Calvin Bridges. He worked out, he was the guy who worked out a lot of stuff about sex linkage that we talked about last week. Uh, he also figured out this whole idea of non-disjunction and polyteen chromosomes, which I'll explain in a little bit. So Bridges is one of those guys who is literally a bridge. He took all that psychological stuff, all the chromosomes stuff that people have been doing, and he took this newfangled genetic stuff that was being done in the fly room and brought them together. Another important guy is this one, Herman Mueller. Uh, Mueller worked out mechanisms of mutations and mutagenesis. So you remember I told you, Mendel, he just goes down to the, he goes down to the seed store and he looks in a catalog and he get all these varieties, but where did the varieties come from? And Mueller's gonna be essential in figuring that out. He's gonna be using mutations, generating mutations to generate all kinds of new varieties of flies for the lab. Okay, and then over here, this is Alfred Sturdivant. We're going to be talking specifically about things he did today. So he's going to work out ways to map genes, figure out where they are on a chromosome. All right. So, uh, like I said, Morgan has a disadvantage compared to Mendel because he doesn't have a, a readily available stock of cheaply purchased varieties of flies. Turns out nobody has been raising flies for domestic purposes. So he had to create these. So he's gonna make this catalog of all these phenotypes. So one of the best known is the white-eyed fly, but he did lots of others. So in the lab, we're gonna be working with uh, white, miniature, and forked. Miniature means it's got miniature wings, it's got little short wings. Yeah, Morgan is going to find that. So again, you gotta imagine he's coming in all the time, staring into his little dissecting microscope, going through hundreds and hundreds of flies, looking for deviations from the normal wild type. So he finds the wide-eyed fly. There it is, isn't that pretty? There's the normal wild type eye. Uh, so he's got all these different varieties that he starts to collect. And recall that one of the key things he figured out when working out that problem of sex linkage is that he identified something important, which is, okay, there's a white gene, and he found it is on the X chromosome. So this is a fly karyotype here. I know it looks kind of weird. 
Um, there's chromosome one, that's the sex chromosome, so this is an X and X, so this is a female fly over here. Uh, this is X over here and Y in the male. So he's figured out this central point that, hey, genes seem to have a physical existence, that they can be tied to specific chromosomes. So he's worked this out. We know now X is right in here somewhere. We don't know where. We don't know that it has a specific location on X. You know, at the time, in, in the 1910, it, it was still an open question. What is the nature of a gene and where would it be? And what does it do? And what does it look like? All these sorts of things. But at least Morgan has this idea we can localize one gene, the white gene, to the X chromosome. In addition, he identified lots of other mutants. So miniature is one of them. Fort is one of them. These are all genes that he could specifically say, hey, those get inherited in a sex-specific way, therefore they are on the X chromosome. But he's got to figure out how they're organized on that sex chromosome. How is it all laid out? That's the mystery. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh. Technology, it's defeating me. There we go. Come, there we go. Not quite. Let's go one more. One more. Okay. <laughs> okay, that was a struggle. Anyway, so uh, there were hints, some pretty good hints. So like I mentioned, Calvin Bridges had discovered these things. These are polyteen chromosomes. And where they are found is in the salivary glands of Drosophila. So here, this is a pupa right here. And it's been stained for, with a probe for the salivary gland. So there they are. Uh, they're busy regressing at this point. So the pupa doesn't have much need for salivary glands, obviously. So it is busy breaking those down as it pupates. But in the larva, they've got these gigantic, huge salivary glands. And so, you know, as you can see, they take up a lot of space in the animal's body. Now, I told you before, how the larvae live. They crawl through that medium that you've provided for them, and they are constantly spewing out saliva, digesting the medium ahead of them, making a kind of soup, and then slurping it up. In order to do that, you need to make a lot of digestive enzymes. You gotta make a lot of saliva. So one of their adaptations is to have gigantic salivary glands. So they're just, they're just constantly drooling out saliva here. Another adaptation though is if you look at individual cells within those salivary glands, they have huge chromosomes. The chromosomes are so huge you can see them in the microscope. So they're gigantic. The way they get gigantic is they, they form polyteen chromosomes, which just basically means the DNA replicates and then the cell doesn't divide. The DNA replicates, it replicates, it replicates. So a chromosome in the salivary gland is made up of thousands of strands of DNA, all stacked up, all lined up. This has a couple of virtues. It means you can even see them. You can just peel out the salivary glands. They kind of pull out fairly easily. You can squash them, put them on a microscope. And you can see things like this. So here's one chromosome. So this is the second chromosome. And when you do that, you can see these banding patterns. They have a consistent set of bands from animal to animal. So this is a big hint right there, right? Maybe, maybe genes are somehow associated with these bands. So we can see these things visibly 
and this particular example. Another thing that was observed is if you look at some of these, like right there, uh, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. There are these things called puffs. And these seem to be associated with sites of active transcription. So not, not only can you see a pattern, you can see this banding pattern, which is pretty cool all in itself, but you can also see hints to the metabolic activity that's going on with these chromosomes. So one idea is, hey, maybe there are genes associated with these bands, and what's going on is when they puff up, is that there is active transcription of enzymes from those genes. So that's an important insight. Another thing is that because these get duplicated and duplicated and get really thick and visible, you can also see abnormalities in the chromosomes. So sometimes, for instance, uh, and we'll talk about this later in the course, there are truncations, that there are deletions of whole chunks of a chromosome, so maybe a whole piece of this gets lost along with all the genes associated with it, which means that any genes on the complementary chromosome uh, in a single copy are now exposed and you can see them. You can also, if you've got a really good eye, I, I do not, I cannot do this, but if you have a really good eye and you look closely, you might be able to look at these particular regions and see inversions. That's where a chunk of the chromosome has been turned around. And we'll talk more about that later too. Inversions are lots of fun. So we can see some details about what's going on here. In the modern day, the other neat thing about these, that I didn't believe they could do this when I first heard about it, but you can go in with really fine needles and you take this squash polyteen chromosome and you cut out the piece you're interested in just physically chop up the chromosome, pull out particular bands and then you can do things like use PCR to expand the sequences in there uh, you can look at what's, what genes are actually there at a molecular level so lots of fun games you can play with these so uh, Bridges discovered these turned out to be incredibly useful. And they're a big hint, too, that, hey, genes have a physical address on a chromosome. Because these patterns are consistent from animal to animal. So we want to figure out how, how that works. All right, now this is a reminder way back, when was this, like the second week of the course or something? I told you about Mendel's Law. So this is Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment. Um, and you recall, it, this is this rule that during gamete formation, during meiosis, segregating pairs of unit factors assort independently of each other. So if you have two genes on the chromosome that you're interested in, they assort completely independently when you go through meiosis. Just total chance which arrangement ends up in the progeny. Uh, we're going to discover that this also doesn't always hold true. Sometimes Mendel missed some important phenomena, and this is one of them, that the law of independent assortment isn't really a law, it's more of a guideline. It sort of works most of the time. But there are special cases that Morgan is going to take advantage of where they don't. Okay, so again, going back, way, way back, early in the course, this stuff, it's, it's all second nature to you at this point, I hope. Really basic Mendelian crosses. So here we're saying we, we're going to do a dihybrid test cross. So we got a heterozygote for two loci right there, A, A, big A, little A, big B, little B. And we're going to cross that to a homozygous recessive individual for both loci. So there's our cross, and if we do the old Punnett square, the Punnett square in this case is really easy, right? Because you're crossing it to little a, little a, little b, little b. That can only produce one type of gamete. That's it right there. It's only going to produce haploid little a, little b gametes. This 
heterozygote here can produce four different combinations. So that's what we see there. And we do our Punnett square. And we figure out, oh, well, then 25% of the progeny will look like this, 25% like that, 25% like that, 25% like that. We just kind of take that for granted that you get a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio out of this kind of simple test cross. And that's what Mendel would have predicted. That's what he would tell you. But here's the question now. We just said, okay, we've got, we've got these chromosomes and they got a physical structure and you've got genes all distributed along them. What if the A and B genes we're looking at here are on the same chromosome? So here's a complicated cartoon to illustrate that. So here's our parent cell. So we're, again, we're just doing the big A, little A, big B, little B cross uh, with a individual that's going to be homozygous this guy right here. So here's our parent. So this is the heterozygous parent. And again, you remember from meiosis that there's a duplication of each chromosome. So these are two identical chromatids. Over here, two identical chromatids. And we're going to go through meiosis and we're going to separate these all out. Well, in this case, if the A and B genes are on the same chromosome, it's like there's a physical matrix that has stuck them together. They're in close association. So when you do the meiotic division, I'm leaving out something, I'll ask you about it in a moment. When you do the meiotic division, you get these each of these strands of DNA separated out into a, one of four gametes. But this is what you would end up with if you put this guy over here and this one over here, and this one over there, and this one over there. Oh, you only get two kinds of gametes. There's four of them, but one kind of gamete is big A, big B, the other kind is little a, little b. What have I left off? Have I forgot to mention something from meiosis that's kind of important? <coughs> Think back, we talked about meiosis so much. There was another feature of meiotic prophase. Yes? Uh, recombination? Yeah. We should be seeing crossovers. So you remember this stuff. There were these chiasma that formed. That There were little things that swapped. Segments, uh, it, there was a process called crossing over. So we got a crossing over between homologous chromosomes which would rearrange things. And I told you at that time, that's really important, right? But here we're going to show you why it's really important. So if we go back to this little diagram, what if there was a crossover event between this chromatid and this chromatid? So we swap a segment of the chromosome between the two. Okay? When you do that, this, what you will end up with is, look over here, this chromosome is intact. It's still big A, big B, there it goes. This chromosome is intact, there it goes, it's little a, little b. But now we've got, between these two chromosomes, is we've got an exchange that occurs. Now this chromosome couples big A with little b. And this one couples little a with big B. We get those over there. So this is an important process for rearranging the order of the alleles on the chromosome. We've got lots of names for this. So over here you can see, okay, we've got these four gametes that result from the single crossover event. And now what you've got is these types that retain the original arrangement. And those are called either non-crossover gametes there was no crossover that occurred there. We also call these non-recombinant gametes. And just to confuse you, a third name for exactly the same thing, we can also call this the parental arrangement. Because these chromosomes have the same association between their alleles 
that we saw in the original parents. So those are the non-crossovers. There are also crossover gametes, as you might guess. That makes sense. So we've got a crossover here, so we're going to call these two crossover gametes. We'll also call them recombinant gametes. So they have recombined and rearranged the order of the alleles on the chromosome. Uh, something else to mention here is, you know, as I've, I've conveniently drawn this in this way, you can also have crossovers between, uh, for instance, these two. Yeah, if you have a crossover between this chromosome and this chromosome, what will it look like? Will you see it? Ah, it's an invisible crossover. Because you get the same arrangement of alleles on both of these chromosomes, so you don't, you don't get to see that. You can also have multiple crossovers, and we'll get to that a little later. It's not like there's a rule that says you can only cross over once. So we can have multiple crossover events. We're going to take advantage of that in the next lab, by the way. So we've got this. Also, what's important is it turns out that where the crossover occurs is important. So if you had a crossover up here, yeah, you definitely had a rearrangement of the genetic material, but with respect to A and B, it's invisible. You're not going to see it. And likewise, it can happen down here. You're not going to see it. So this is, this is a key point that Morgan makes. The crossover is only visible with respect to A and B if it falls between A and B. And as you might, you might speculate a little bit yourself, okay, uh, we got to have a crossover right here for it to be visible, for it to create those recombinant gametes. What if A and B are really, really close? They're next door neighbors. What's the probability? Oh, it'll be lower, right? You'll be less likely to get a crossover precisely between here. Likewise, what if they're very far apart on the chromosome? Then there's a pretty good chance that a crossover will split them up. So you get the idea. Morgan is seeing this, he's thinking, hey, this is, this is an amazing insight. I would not have thought of this myself. That's why, that's why he gets, gets a Nobel Prize, is because he's smart enough to see this. Is he realized that probably what that means is that the frequency of generating recombinant gametes is proportional to the distance between the two loci. So two loci far apart, you get lots of recombination. Two loci are really close together, you get very little. So he's got, an, he's got an in now. He's got a way he can figure this out. Yeah, we just have to do these dihybrid test crosses, crosses, and we will get a measure of the recombination frequency, and that tells us how far apart a couple of genes are. So that's his big insight. So frequency of recombination is going to be proportional with the distance between two genes. Simple and elegant. He is going to come up with a couple of ideas relative to this. So genes seem to like discrete positions or loci in the chromosome. It's hard to imagine it now. But back at the turn of the last century, they didn't know. You know, who knows? Genes could be floating around on the chromosome. Uh, they could be bouncing between chromosomes. Who knows? We have no concept of what a gene is. And so this is saying, you know, they, they get specific locations. This is going to generate a, a sort of flawed model of how genes are organized. That chromosomes are, and genes are like, they're like beads on a necklace. So we just got specific beads located along the chromosome. That's not the best, it's not the best analogy, but it was a working idea for a long time. So we're going to say, okay, genes, they have a place on a chromosome. And we can measure 
the distance between loci using a dihybrid test cross. Oh, hooray, we, we've got genetics we can do. It's so what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks is we're going to use a dihybrid test cross and we're going to measure the frequency of recombination between a couple of genes and we'll be able to generate a map. So that's our goal before the end of the semester. So let's get a map. Uh, he also noticed that, well, recombination frequencies are going to be vary between 0 and 50%. So the greatest distance you can measure with this is 50%. Uh, I think my next slide is, yeah, no, my next slide doesn't, I'll explain this in a moment. There's a good reason why the maximum is 50%, and I will get to it today, don't worry. I'll just leave you hanging for a few minutes. Uh, so what I want to do next is, let's talk about a specific example. Here, this is chromosome 2, and as, as we said, Morgan was getting this catalog of genes. He's got lots of these different traits that he can look at, uh, and here's a few of them. So on chromosome 2, there's a gene called Aristolus, which causes an absence of the distal segment of the antenna. There's one called purple eyes. There's one called vestigial wings. And there's one called speck body, which just makes little specks all over the cuticle. So we, we got these four genes. I'm going to just focus right here. This is what you have to remember here. Purpleized vestigial. They're on chromosome two. And we want to know how far apart are they. So let's do the experiment. Let's do a dihybrid test cross. Okay, here's what Mendel would predict. I know this is a very cluttered, complicated diagram. Uh, let me explain it to you. So here what we're doing is we're saying, okay, uh, we've got a male who is homozygous recessive, so we're purple and vestigial. So he's little PR, little PR, little VG, little VG, okay? And we've illustrated him with purple chromosomes, just so I can tell them apart. Over here is a female who is a heterozygote. She's got purple and vestigial on one chromosome, this purple one right here. And on the yellow one, she's got the wild type alleles. We're going to come back to this point next week. But this is called the arrangement of alleles. The arrangement of alleles here is that the female has purple and vestigial, the recessive ones, on one chromosome, and she's got the wild type on the other chromosome. We could also do this experiment if we had wild type and vestigial here, and purple and wild type here. And it makes a difference, as we'll see later. Don't worry about it today. Okay, now if we were Mendel, and we got this idea, okay, purple and vestigial, there's, there's two traits. We could then do our little Punnett square, although Mendel didn't know about Punnett squares. He would have found them handy, I think. Anyway, so there's, the, we can make four different kinds of alleles. And here we can only, this male can only make one kind of gamete. So we have four gametes here, one gamete here, Punnett square, and if this were Mendel, we would say, okay, 25% will be of the parental type. See, this is a parental type with purple and vestigial. 25% will be of this other parental type. See this individual? She's wild type and wild type and phenotype. So 25% will be like that. And 25% will be purple with long wings. And 25% will be vestigial winged, short winged, and also have wild type eyes. So that's, that's what Mendel would predict. He would be wrong. Notice that the way I've drawn these colors, in order to make these two combinations, you have to have had a crossover event right between purple and vestigial. Okay, that's the only way you can get these combinations. So what's going on here? Well, then, why would you expect that these would be equally common with these two? 
Often, if you've got two genes close to each other, the recombinants will be reduced in frequency. You'll get rarer cases of recombination, whereas the parentals will be much more common. Okay, to illustrate that, let's, let's do some hypotheticals. What if we said no crossovers allowed? You can't have any kind of crossovers occur in these plots. Then you get this situation where you only produce, you can only pass on this chromosome intact or this chromosome intact, combine it with this purple vestigial chromosome over here, you only get two results. So you don't see one to one to one to one, you see one to zero to zero to one, right? 50% of each. This is entirely hypothetical, although not really, because it turns out in flies, fun fact, male flies do not carry out recombination. It's not going to affect any of our crosses. But there are situations where you get no recombination between two chromosomes, and you would get something like this. Okay, the other possibility is what if we have all kinds of crossovers? We have crossovers all the time. That some mechanism forces a crossover to occur between purple and vestigial in every event. And then you get all recombinants. This one really is hypothetical. We don't know of any way to do this. It's a probabilistic thing. Where the crossover will occur, and how many crossovers it will occur. So I, I don't know of any real life examples of this. You would think if you had totally random crossover events, you'd get 50% recombinate and 50% parental. But don't worry about that, because it doesn't happen. So this is just speculative stuff. All right, so Morgan does the experiment. Let's take our homozygous recessive purple vestigial, whoop, don't push that button too soon. You have this homozygous recessive male over here. Here's our heterozygote female. And there's the gametes that are produced. And then you get offspring from this. And you score the offspring for what they look like. And these are the actual numbers you saw. So 5.4% of the time, you got these purple-eyed flies with long wings, 5.3%. You got the short-winged flies with wild-type eyes. And then these two uh, parental types are much more common. How would you interpret this then? Yeah? Uh, when recombination occurs, it happens either above or below these two. Right. Yes, so the, the, the possibility of a random crossover event along the chromosome hitting the bullseye, that is right in this space right here, is relatively low. In fact, we can now give, put a number on this. Look at this. This, this is another cool thing Morgan did, is he looked at this and he said, hey, the frequency of recombination here is 5.4 plus 5.3. It's 10.7% of my flies are recombinant. So that's a number. Oh, we love our numbers in genetics. So we can plug a number in here and we can say, okay, recombination frequency here is 10.7. And let's take it another step further. This is, this is Morgan's convention. He said, let's just call that a map distance. Let's just say, hey, PR and VG are therefore 10.7 map units apart. We're immediately transforming this abstract percentage into a map distance. So that's 10.7 map units between purple and vestigial. Uh, there was also a move 
it's still around, but they still also call these Santa Morgans after Thomas Hunt Morgan. I don't know if Morgan really liked that. But anyway, Santa Morgans or map units, that's what we're looking at here, the distance between these particular genes. So this is a major insight. Now also, uh, we have to think of all the possibilities. So there can be all kinds of different crossover events that occur. So here's our, here's our parental types, and you can imagine a crossover up here between purple and aristolus could rearrange those two alleles relative to each other, but they won't affect the, arrange, the relative arrangement of purple and vestigial. Likewise here, purple and vestigial are fine, there's a crossover down here. Uh, the relationship of vestigial to speck or purple to speck has changed, or aristolus to speck. So it's all a relative thing. Which, which genes are you looking at? And there's all these other pots. So here, for instance, there's a, there's a double crossover. Oh, this was kind of confounding because what it meant is you could have a crossover between the two genes you're interested in, right in here, and then there's a second crossover in there, and it swaps them jet right back to where they were at the beginning. So they become invisible again. The crossover has become invisible. So lots of games we can play with this, and we will when we do our triple point crosses. Okay, now oh, here's the question I was going to answer earlier. Why is the maximum frequency of recombination 50%? Why is it always 0 to 50%? Uh, that's because it occurs during prophase of meiosis 1, when everything is in tetrads like we see over here. And a single recombination event can only cross over the strands between two of the strands. Makes sense, right? A single crossover event, you're not going to... It's not going to somehow juggle around three different strands of DNA. So, yeah, that's, that's why it's a max of 50%. Uh, this also leads to other complications, which we're just going to kind of sweep under the rug for right now. That what if you have a double crossover? Like here's, here's our crossover right there. What if there is a double crossover that instead involves this chromatid and this one over here? Yeah, you can get all kinds of funky rearrangements of genes here, but they're going to be of increasingly lower frequency the more, the more elaborate and the larger the number of crossovers we expect. So in general, we can sort of ignore them. Uh, double crossovers are going to turn out to be really interesting. We'll get into that next week. Okay, so there's, our, there's what we've done with this one simple experiment, you've determined a map distance between two genes. And for a time in the Morgan lab, that's what they did. Keep on generating new mutants. Let's go look at new phenotypes. And then you try and figure out what chromosome is it on. And you do crossover tests like this to see what other genes it is linked to and the distance between them. So at the end result of all this few years of activity, they got a long list of genes, and they can look at them and they can say, okay, purple and aristolus are this distance apart, purple and vestigial are this distance apart, uh, purple and uh, what was the other one I had down there? Whatever the other one was, as a certain distance. So you make these tables of pairs of genes and the distance between them. The crossover frequency. Yes? This doesn't really work if, a, if it takes multiple genes to create a single allele, right? Oh, oh, now you get into another of those complications that I mentioned earlier. Yes, good, good of you to remember that. Uh, that if you've got pleiotropic effects or multigenic effects, it gets harder to sort these out. But, uh, generally what you're doing with these kinds of experiments is you're doing very thorough, very brutal analyses of the flies and you can recognize a pr primary effect. 
So as you know from your research on fly base, that for instance, uh, the, the two genes you were working with in the previous cross, they have multiple effects. But all you're doing is scoring one. You're just like, oh, eye color. I'm not worrying about gonad color. But you can imagine that that might complicate some of these results. Okay. So here's the here's another little complication. So we just figured, okay, purple and vestigial, they're 10.7 map units apart, 10.7% recombination frequency. What about these two? So we got speck and aristolus. As I drew them, they are far, far apart on the chromosome. There's a huge distance here. They're so far apart that if we do the experiment, what we'd find is the map distance between them, the recombination frequency, is 50%. 50% is the magic number. It says, oh, those two genes are unlinked. They got no connection to one another that you can determine by these experiments. So we're also going to see that when you compare genes on different chromosomes. There they act like Mendelian units and you do get independent assortment. It's only when they're on the same chromosome that you don't. And furthermore, even if they are on the same chromosome, if they're far enough apart, since uh, crossovers are fairly frequent, it means you cannot get to the point where the speck and restless are 50% or 50 map units. So why did I draw them on this map at all? Right? If I knew that this was 50 map units away from this, which just means it's unlinked, it could be on another chromosome for all that matter, why would we come up with this idea that Speck was on the same chromosome as Aristolus? How would you figure that out? Here's a yes. Maybe looking at the uh, sister chromatid that wasn't involved in the crossover? The sister, oh. No, that, that wouldn't help you at all. No. There's something else you're missing here that's kind of obvious in the diagram. There's a lot of genes on a single chromosome, right? So I just told you, okay, this one, so far from this one, you can't tell. What do you think the map distance here would be? Speck to vestigial, or purple to wristless, or purple to a speck, whatever. Yeah, all you need to do is show a connection to one other gene on the chromosome and you linked it. So you get no detectable uh, recombination here, restless to spec, but when you look at spec to vestigial, you get another number that allows you to say, hey, spec is on the same chromosome as vestigial. And it's so many map units away from vestigial. Okay, so that's, that's another step forward as we start assembling these sorts of things. And then what that allows us to do is the next big insight comes from Alfred Sturdivant, who noticed this. He figured this out. Hey, you got, you got this big notebook full of pairwise map distances between all these different genes. What if I took that home one night? He did. He was an undergraduate at the time, by the way. So he was an undergraduate student at Columbia University, and just he was helping out in the lab, and he had this insight. And he didn't actually take the notebooks down away, because that would be bad. But he wrote down these map distances, and he sat down in his dorm room and did some thinking. And he, OK, for instance, here's a couple of examples. So yellow and white are really close to each other. So they're 0.5 map units apart. And uh, white and miniature, yeah, they're farther apart. That's 34.5 map units. 
and then you looked at yellow in miniature, 35.4. Oh, logic! Logic comes into play here. If you're organizing these on a simple linear map, there's only one possible arrangement for them. So white must be in between yellow and miniature. So you put this little map together. The, notice the distances aren't perfectly adding up. 34.5 plus 0.5. Uh, we should have been 34.9 map units here, but it's 35.4. That happens because the farther apart two genes are, the less accurate your measurements. Because of all those complications I mentioned, like double and triple crossovers that occur between them. But he's able to take these, these numbers here from a boring kind of table and put them together and make the first genetic map. Illustrating the position of these relative to each other. Again, another huge stride forward. This has become kind of a cottage industry now. So here's a partial map of the Drosophila chromosomes. So, you know, let's see, we got some familiar ones marked out. There's brown. There's brown eyes. That's on chromosome 2. And there's scarlet. It's on chromosome 3, as many of you have noticed in, you noted and wrote in your introductions to this lab report. So we got locations for these. These are unlinked. So we get 50% rearrangement if we did that recombination experiment. And then over here, here's some more. There's there's the ones we're going to start working with right after spring break. There's white eyes, miniature wings, and forked bristles. They're all on the X chromosome. So there's a big hint for you. But then we got all these other genes. Look at all of them. If you get on Flybase, you can find they've got some maps there that are more complete than this. Uh, Drosophila has roughly 10 to 15,000 genes. So you know if they tried to squeeze them all into this kind of diagram, it would be rather intimidating. All right, we've done similar things for other species. Uh, this is called building a framework. So we're going to build a, a skeleton framework of the arrangement of genes on an organism. Uh, this was done with humans. Humans are really hard to do experiments on. But there are some techniques we'll talk about later for estimating the distance between genes in humans. Some of it's things like pedigree analysis that helps us figure this out. So we got rough distances there. It allows you to say, okay, gene X and gene Y are on chromosome 7. We don't know what else is there. So then we do that brute force molecular biology thing of forcing the DNA through a sequencer and then we figure it all out. We can use those anchor points to map where we are and then figure out what's next to that using molecular techniques. Uh, but it's, this is routinely done with lots of organisms. Uh, zebrafish, for instance, have, I think it's 50 chromosomes. And we also could do linkage experiments like we do with the fly here with those. And we've got a rough idea of where various genes are. And then again, molecular biology comes in and rips through it. In 1910, they did not have molecular biology tools to do this. So these were all figured out using these genetic techniques, which I think is kind of awesome. Harder than molecular biology less less uh, less nitpicky and less demanding. But still you need a lot of abstract thinking to figure this out. Okay, so this is the key thing to take away from this. Is, is Morgan's big idea. Is that we can do a dihybrid test cross and we can thereby figure out the relative frequency of crossover events between two genes. And that gives us an idea of their relative positions. And these are huge insights for 1910, 1915. Uh, the idea that genes, genes occupy a specific position on a chromosome 
that we can measure that position and the distance between them, and uh, that we can get a measure of how, how close genes are to one another to produce these gene maps. All right. This is, I, I don't want to get into this yet. We're going to spend next week going over this in excruciating detail. What we see here is the utility of double crossover events. So here's, this is the same kind of diagram I showed you earlier, but now we're doing a tri-hybrid cross. So we've got an individual that's big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C. And we're going to cross that in a test cross to an individual that's little A, little A, little B, little B, little C, little C, okay? If we have a double crossover, we get these very interesting results. So now we've got, for instance, this is a double crossover that separates A and B and B and C at the same time. And that's a tool we're going to use to measure the distances between three genes at once. So you may, may remember, I told you our next cross, we're using white, miniature, and fork. That's three genes. Are we going to measure them pairwise? Are we going to measure the recombination frequency between white and miniature, and then miniature and forked, and then forked and white, or whatever? That would be a long experiment. And we wouldn't be able to get it done before the end of the semester. But if we've got a trick where we can measure all three at once, and the key to that is recognizing what the double crossover gametes are. And that's going to take a little math and logic. So I'm, I'm not going to inflict that on you right now. We'll do that next week. So sit and digest this stuff. So uh, where, where if I go back to the beginning. Be sure and read chapter 5 thoroughly. It'll make it easier to understand when I get into the tricky stuff next week. But now you got the basics. Okay, so I'm going to go to my office and I'm going to get the exam transcribed on the canvas. Look for it in about an hour or two and uh, have fun with it.